I'm Tammy, a brown belt and coach from the UK. I joined Premium with the free seven day trial about a year ago, and I haven't regretted that once. I immediately binged on some audio content. The Discord server is worth the cost of membership alone. It's uh, a bit like entering a virtual open mat full of white to black belts from various countries. And the vibe's always friendly and respectful and helpful. I highly recommend joining BJJ Mental Models Premium. And I look forward to chatting with you in their Discord server. Those are some words from Tammy. She's one of hundreds of grapplers around the world who have leveled up their jujitsu game with BJJ Mental Models Premium. Join Premium today and you'll get the world's largest library of jiu-jitsu audio courses on strategy and tactics, plus direct coaching from black belt world champions, plus access to the most valuable online jiu-jitsu community. Your first week's free, so please check it out now at bjjmentalmodels.com or check the link in the show notes. Welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 262. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, back again with friend of the show, Mr. Rob Bernacki. How's it going, Rob? It's going great, man. It sure has been a while since we spoke. Oh, yeah. It feels like it's been a lifetime. <laughs> now, hey, I don't know if we need to do an intro or anything because, again, hasn't been that long, but there has been a major update. You've been a lot of things in your life, Rob. You've been a grappler, you've been a coach, you've been a business person, but you've never been a, a piece of art before. That's new for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The, we, we got a sweet, what are we calling this? Is this a token? Is this a... Uh... <laughs> I wanted it to be a patch. So for those who don't know, I always want BJJ Mental Models to be an inclusive podcast. So so for those out there who are visually impaired and didn't get the memo, Rob has now been immortalized alongside Stefan Kesting as a, a piece of art. If you have ever wanted a dramatic picture of Rob stomping Stefan in the taint and sending him for two points, we have that now. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> maybe the most unhinged piece of merch that's ever been made in the history of jujitsu but you know what people seem to like it and who am i to argue with the market right rob well the market knows all <laughs> yeah so for those who don't know the backstory here every year for our premium subscribers we send out a kind of free patch and a decal kit and we make some new designs every year and this year one of the designs is an artist's depiction of the classic rob and stefan video in which rob teaches the taint sweeps to stefan kesting and if you haven't seen the taint sweep i mean i can put a link in the show notes but it's exactly what you think it is you basically grab one of their legs you grab the other leg and then you just stomp them in the taint as hard as you can and i believe that the logic is that that's not technically illegal because the ibjjf at no point spells out taint-based penalties correct i believe it's fair game well it's not just not technically illegal it's not illegal at all <laughs> there's no like i don't think there's a like we're not playing with a gray area you're allowed to put your foot you know anywhere and push you're just not allowed to strike so as long as you don't create separation and like hoof someone in the dick, you're fine. It's uh, you know, it's one of those things that qualifies as a them problem, not a you problem. If they don't want pressure on their taint, all they have to do is fall down. <laughs> I will say this. I have practiced some of your more marquee techniques, Rob, like the taint sweep and the dick post. And this is as close as I have ever gotten to being in one of those Bullshito Sistema videos where the coach is there and people line up and come at him and he waves his hand and they just go flying like without any contact at all. The thing I have found is if people know that you're going for a taint sweep or a dick post, they will just fall over on their own. Fall down, yeah. <laughs> They don't want any part of that. I was at Matt's gym teaching one time for him and I taught the dick post and I couldn't even get my Uki during training to stay still long enough to demonstrate the technique because he was just trying to get the fuck out of there. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this is why my preferred Uki for these demonstrations is Rory because it does give me great joy to like launch him in the air. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Via the taint. <laughs> well, I, you know what? Just for those who missed the memo, I will put a link to this wonderful piece of art in the show notes, as well as the taint sweep video for those who want to level up their taint game. But yeah, anyway, there you go. I was also saying we should probably turn this into an NFT, right? We might as well just go all the way, see if we can shake people down for some money. Well, I mean, if we, if we need at this point yet another like, you know, Darwin Award slash IQ test slash gullibility test at this point, if you're still buying an NFT from anybody... You deserve to get fleeced, so you may as well give us your money. <laughs> exactly. So uh, join BJJ Concepts and BJJ Mental Models Premium, I suppose. But anyway, believe it or not, five minutes in, we're not actually here to talk about taints and NFTs. Exactly. As much as I would love to do a podcast about this, and I'm not going to rule out an entire taint-based, NFT-based podcast at some point, we're here today to talk about gamification. Now, we actually wanted to do this with Rob and Stefan, because you guys are putting out a new instructional on this shortly, but unfortunately, Stefan is off actually doing legitimate hero stuff. He literally had to go fight a fire. Yes, he literally had to go fight a fire. You know, when people say, hey, sorry, I can't. I got, I got a fire to put out. Yeah, <laughs> actually. It was actually a legitimate fire. Yeah, Stefan's a firefighter for those who don't know. But anyway, all of that aside, let's talk about gamification, Rob. Um, this is a fun concept. It's been around in my industry, in the software world for a long time, because a few decades ago, a bunch of extremely ethical people realized they could take boring business stuff and add game-based elements and kind of psychologically hook people in and try to make things more interesting than they actually are. But this has also been a, a very growing area of jujitsu coaching, especially in the last decade or so. I know that you You've been a big advocate of this with your fuck your jujitsu system for a long time. Maybe tell me a little bit about this. I mean, talk about what gamification means to you. And probably also, let's explain exactly what it is and where the line is. Because when you hear people talk about other coaching methods, like, um, you know, when they're talking about eco-based coaching or any of that stuff, sometimes they talk about gamification. But they're actually different things. It's just sometimes this gets co-opted into other systems as well. So why don't you tell us what gamification really is and how this all came about in your system? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought up the business thing and trying to make something more interesting than they actually is. Because if there's one thing I need is a gimmick to try to make me more interesting than I actually am. So that's kind of why I, I gravitate to this stuff. Um, but in all seriousness, the um, the process of gamification is we're going to probably get into the weeds a little bit because like ultimately jujitsu is just a game, right? So if we say, you know, we're gamifying jujitsu, like how do you gamify a game that's already a game, right? Like jujitsu has is certainly if we're going to you know, treat it as a sport, it's just got certain rules and you're allowed to do certain things. You're not allowed to do other things. And so that makes it a game. But what you'll find is when you establish the parameters of the game, as it is, one of the big appeals about jujitsu is the game is very vast, right? Like amongst grappling styles, I would say jujitsu has certainly if you're going to go into the no gi, like more open rule sets, it has the, and even in the gi, it has the least amount of restrictions in that, you know, like there are a bunch of different win conditions, but it's like a pin doesn't end the match. A takedown doesn't end the match. Pretty like all the other grappling styles, whether they be gi based or, or no gi or wrestling judo, there is a more hyper specificity that's created by the rules. So with jujitsu, because it's so vast and because so much is allowed there's so many different things that we're working on gamification is the process let's you know specific to jujitsu of taking those subcategories taking the specific skills that you are trying to develop and creating games or you know constraints right like the probably the most common term that people will have heard that describes this is constraints-based learning so we are trying to create a set of constraints a game within the game that allows you to focus on skills that would otherwise be very difficult to get good at, at least get good at quickly within the more open, you know, sandbox type of environment that we've got when we're rolling for a number of reasons that we'll probably get into throughout this discussion. So yeah, gamification is basically taking subcategories and creating really specific rules around what you can and can't do with the aim of encouraging skill development, uh, discovery, and also depending on how you do it. And then one of the ideas behind Fuck Your Jiu-Jitsu is creating an, a certain imbalance so that people of varying 
degrees of uh, size, experience, strength, athleticism, et cetera, et cetera, can still train with each other. So like if you don't create the different restrictions that we create with all of the different games that we make, if you just have people do jujitsu together, somebody who's more experienced or stronger or more flexible or faster, or whatever, will just win a lot of the time. And frankly, less actual jujitsu or less actual development occurs. It becomes much more of a, just an athletic exchange or, you know, like, like the stronger person will win more often. So there's a, so many considerations for how to develop the different aspects of jujitsu. Cause again, there's just so many things. There's, there's guard, there's passing, there's sweeping, there's submissions from the bottom, submissions from the top, there's takedowns, there's counter wrestling, there's submissions to counter takedowns, there's taking people down into submissions, there's dominant positions, there's escapes from dominant positions, transitions and back takes. There's so many things to try to get good at. And it's actually quite difficult to be a well-rounded grappler and be good at all of these things if all you ever do is just learn techniques and then roll like full-on free sparring, no restrictions. That is an insanely difficult prospect unless you're in just an absolute savant or an incredible athlete. So if you don't have a process for creating skill, because uh, you know ultimately the skill in jujitsu comes from playing the game, right? Like one of the distinctions that's made in ecological approaches is like pretty much the best way to learn and develop a skill is to do so during the course of gameplay, just drilling, just practicing a technique against no or minimal resistance is a really poor way to translate a skill. So now imagine you're trying to learn a movement and then try to translate that into a skill when so many things are possible in an unrestricted role. So by creating these restrictions, by creating these parameters, by creating these constraints and these, these rules of these different games, you allow people to optimize the process of translating from explicit to implicit knowledge to where it just becomes something that their body does because they've played a game based around it. Yeah. Was that too convoluted or does that make sense? No, no. I think that was a great explanation. The challenge that often comes up when you dig into systems like this is how do you distill this down into plain speak? And one of the things I like about gamification is that it is quite easy to just take this idea, explain it and slot it into systems. If you take a look at a lot of other coaching models like reverse classroom or eco-based coaching systems. The challenge there is that they are very complicated and they're very specific. You have to kind of do your legwork if you want to understand what they are and how to fit in. But gamification is really just about incentives and motivation and building ways to instill that in your user, so to speak. In the software world, gamification is huge. So you'll, you probably have noticed if you're an old person like I am and like Rob is that, you know, around the beginning of the 21st century, there was this big push to gamify a lot of software. And all of a sudden, Every software product that you use and every website you go to has little badges they're trying to reward you and they're giving you points and they're you're getting to level up and they've got a little progress bar going across the screen. These are basically psychological tricks. That's gamification in action. They're taking the kind of elements that you would often get in games. And in this case, they're taking things like the level up and the progression systems out of video games and they're putting them into boring shit like work software. And the idea is that if you do it right, this can keep people engaged and maybe even equally important, it can also help direct their attention to what you as the coach or the guide want people to see. Because you're right, the traditional approach, Rob, in jiu-jitsu has been kind of open field. The idea being that you learn by doing, which is true, but in the absence of any structure, if you're just free rolling, then people have a tendency to kind of gravitate towards their A game, right? They have to deliberately try to push themselves out of their comfort zone and to try new things. And not everyone's going to know how to do that or be good at doing that for themselves. So gamification can be a super powerful system for coaching. And again, like I said, one of the beautiful things about gamification is you can drop that into almost anything, anything that you're building, if it's a product or whatever, you can use gamification to help incentivize people and steer behavior. It's just a way of rewarding people for doing the thing that you as the coach want them to do. Yeah. And I would argue a huge part of the value is not just the reward for doing what 
I want them to do. It's more so the, not more so, but certainly like at least equal, if not more so, the liberation from the concern about losing. So like basically lowering the cost of failure. One of the things that I find probably the most difficult about like the beginner process of learning jujitsu, aside from the fact that, you know, it's fucking hard, uh, like it's a complex art, but it's really difficult to get people out of their head about the idea that they're fighting because it is a combat sport because it is so you know not actually life and death but certainly the simulation of life and death where like you know if i choked you and you tapped and i didn't let go you would die so there's a a level of just like taking it too seriously you know i often tell my students like hey guys we're not fighting each other we're fighting injuries like we've got a lot of phrases that we try to get people to like internalize to get them out of the mentality that this is a place you come to to fight for your life. Like it's fucking recess for adults. It's a game. Don't take it that seriously. But when people first come to it, they're like, oh shit, this is a fight. And when you're in a fight, you don't want to lose or you want to win. Again, kind of depending on which side of it you come at from, but it doesn't really matter whether it's you just want to win or you just don't want to lose. They're both equally detrimental in that you are, like you said earlier, you're going to go with your A game. And if you don't have an A game as a beginner, what are you going to do? You're going to spaz like a motherfucker. Like I actually had a guy come in for an intro session last week and I explained how like, you know, flailing about is not beneficial. And he's like, but wouldn't it be beneficial if I just really wanted to win? And I just straight (laughs) up stopped him and said, I'm going to be honest with you. If, If you're really concerned about winning and training, this is not the gym for you. And that dude never came back for a second session. And I was glad about that because he was so like, all his questions were very evidently based around, he was trying to figure out a way to win. And that was his main concern. And to me, that's just a guy who is not going to belong here because he's a threat to himself and others. If all he's trying to do is figure out the best way to win in class, like in practice, it's like that Allen Iverson clip that I always reference. Like we talking about practice, you're trying to win practice, motherfucker, get out of my club. Right, so the biggest detriment to people's progress when they're trying to learn jujitsu, especially at the beginning, is they feel like they need to fight for their life, which means they're only ever going to do the thing they're good at, or they're only ever going to do the thing that expresses the most intensity so they can not get beat or so they can try to win. And that's a absolutely terrible way to develop new skills. So by creating games that, yes, incentivize certain behaviors, but more so disincentivize the emphasis on I'm definitely trying to win or I'm definitely trying to not lose. What we can incentivize for people with these little mini games that we do is we're incentivizing you to embrace the process of learning by embracing the process of playing the game. So one of the phrases we use a lot at our club when we do some of these, some of the gamification stuff is don't worry about winning the game worry about playing the game. We want you to try to get good at playing the game because that's where the skill development comes from. And with a lot of the games, if we're able to take the notion of winning and losing out of it, that sets a different playing field for people where they're not worried about being super tense and not allowing anything to happen. Because that's the worst thing. You're trying to get good at jujitsu and most people try to get good at jujitsu by trying to allow the least amount of jujitsu to happen during the role. It's like two white belts in closed guard for five minutes. Fucking nothing happens. You know, two white belts in half guard locked together, not doing anything for five minutes. No jujitsu is actually occurring there. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do to incentivize people, yes, to like pursue certain goals for a win. And when we certainly do that, like we've got gamification that we do at the club that is based around try to hit this goal because you want to win. But we also have a lot of stuff that's based around try to reduce your desire to win and try to just enjoy the process of playing the game. Yeah, you bring up some amazing points there. I think for most people out there who have been training for a while, they may have lost touch with how scary and intimidating jujitsu is for a first timer. I encourage people to think back to try to remember what it was like the first time they stepped on the mats and how terrified they were, especially if they're someone who never really did anything athletic before in their life, 
right? It can be very, very scary. It can put you on the defensive and that's not good for learning. That's also not good as a business owner because you don't want to set that kind of culture where people are afraid of your gym, right? A big part of doing this well as a coach is making your gym feel welcoming, inclusive, and setting a culture of play and of fun. And that's where gamification can really help out. You're absolutely right that with a lot of new people, you have to beat that culture out of them. (laughs) Well, not, not physically, but metaphorically, you have to remove that culture from them where they come in expecting a fight. If you come in and you think the person that you're training with is someone that you're fighting, it's going to impact your entire jujitsu experience, not just your ability to learn, but also your ability to have fun and to make friends. And I mean, if people aren't having fun, they're not going to come back. Right. So, yeah, it is. I would even take this this a step further and say that it's not just new people. So like, you know, we've got, if you haven't heard about our visiting student program yet, we have a visiting student program at my academy, people from anywhere in the world, welcome to come stay for free for one week at my place at the Island Top Team Inn, train for free for work. So like we get the gamut, don't just show up, email the club, get in touch with me, set up a date for you to, to come and train. We're happy to host you. So we get White belts through black belts, you know, and when I say black belts, I mean all levels, hobbyist black belts, high level competitors. We've had black belts come to the club where we're doing, you know, on Thursday nights, we do fuck your jujitsu rounds. On Friday nights, we do positional sparring rounds. And I've had rounds with them where I'm having to tell them like, you know, good black belts where I'm having to tell them like, dude, you got to relax. Like you are treating this round like we're competing and this is a game. Like we're trying to play a game here and you are unbelievably tense right now. Cause you like just chill the fuck out. So this isn't even just a new person thing. This is a, a jujitsu culture thing. Like you said, for some people it's the culture that they have walking in the door, but for some people it's the culture that they have been taught by doing jujitsu for, you know, five or 10 years at a club where every role is a role to the death. And the only way that they know how to train is just to be going balls to the wall all the time. And that's a, like you said, it's a very difficult, very discouraging way to train. And it does turn people away. Yeah, this is one of the challenges to operating in this jujitsu ecosystem. There's a lot of reasons why people would start jujitsu. A lot of people will have overheard a conversation like this one and just thought, wow, this sounds really life-changing and fun and I want to try it. There's people who want to learn self-defense. There's people who maybe lived through a very traumatic experience and they don't ever want to live through it again. And so they want tools to prevent that. But then you're also going to get people who come to jujitsu for ego gratification because they want to dominate people or they want to be perceived as the kind of person who can dominate people. And none of that is conducive to good learning, to good culture. You know, when we talk about the some of the awful shit that can happen in jujitsu, a lot of the time it's because of people like this. And one of the benefits of gamification is in addition to helping the coach focus the training and make things fun, it's a lever that you as the coach can manipulate to alter the culture of the gym. If everyone knows it's a game and everyone's there to have fun and no one's there to win, and you as the coach model that top down, right? And you're putting yourself into difficult positions so that your students can dominate you and give you a hard time. If that's the culture of your gym, you're going to attract the type of people that you probably want to attract as customers, not the type of people who are going to come in and ask how they can dominate the other white belts, right? So I think that's a great point. So with that said, Rob, I mean, we've talked about gamification before. You've been on the podcast to talk about fuck your jujitsu, which is, (laughs) and again, I I love how you describe it as this, your proprietary system for gamification in jujitsu. I love that description because it implies that you've got a patent on this and you're going to sue people if they use the name. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I mean, we say proprietary. Terry. I mean, for one, I want people using the name. Like one thing that I really love is, uh, you know, I, and this is the only time I'm ever going to say that I love anything about Instagram. But like when people tag me in a story where they're like, hey, we're doing fuck your jujitsu tonight. And, you know, I can reshare that. I really love that. So it's not even about proprietary for the purposes of suing people. It's more just that like, if, if anybody's going to talk about fuck your jujitsu, I want to be tagged, I want to be included, and I want to try to spread this notion around the world. As I joke, I want everybody out there doing lots of fucking because it's kind of the most fun way to do this stuff. And so yeah, it's, and I mean, you know, proprietary in the sense that I am quite confident that I came up with (laughs) this particular approach to gamification and I want to share it with everybody. Nice, nice. Now, for those who who missed that episode, I'll put a link in the show notes again, because we had a really detailed talk about the nuts and bolts of, of your fuck your jujitsu system. But part of the reason you're here today is because I believe you and Stefan are working on a new instructional. Now, unfortunately, 
Stefan can't be here. He's too busy doing hero shit to hang out with us, which is totally fair. But maybe you can help me explain what is it that you've packaged together here? You know, this is going to be a very valuable resource for people who want a very easy to understand primer into how both a coach can build games for the students, but presumably how students can also build games for themselves. So maybe talk to me a little bit about how you've got this structured and what you're putting together. Yeah, so that's a really good point that you made about it being both a a resource for coaches and also a resource for students. So like one of the main things that we get when visitors come here is they want to, or they, you know, they'll ask me like, how can I take whatever you know I'm learning here and be able to bring it back to my gym? And the answer, or like, what should I take back to my gym or, you know, questions of that sort. And the invariably the biggest value add I can give people is to teach them how to play these games, how to do fuck your jujitsu rounds, how to do gamified rounds and how to do specific positional sparring rounds, which are all categories of a gamification that we use at my academy. So I've had coaches bring me out and I was recently at, um, at Fulcrum Jiu Jitsu in Colorado showing them, like teaching a seminar on how to do fuck your Jiu Jitsu rounds. And it was actually one of the most well-received seminars that I've ever done. And I was very nervous about that because like, obviously my students are pretty sold on fuck your Jiu Jitsu and the people who already subscribed to my online academy are pretty sore. People who've like got my material from Stefan are sold on it. But, you know, when it comes to a room full of people who have not necessarily done this before, can I show them in the span of a two to three hour seminar, A, how to do it and B, how to do it in a way where they can clearly see the benefit of it and how much better they could get if they did it. And that was sort of the task like, you know, no pressure, Rob, but the coach basically threw this in my lap. He's like, I want my students to love fuck your jujitsu by the time you leave here. I'm like, okay, I'll do my best. But it actually turned out really, really well. And that was part of the genesis behind the idea of the instructional is, you know, I was talking to Stefan and I was like, hey, man, I just did the seminar and it was really well received and da, da, da. and I think I can, you know, kind of present this stuff in a way where, you know, even if somebody is not super familiar with my work, hasn't done all, like isn't even familiar with all the conceptual stuff or whatever, can I still just give them this methodology to a, show people how to play these games if they're a coach, but B, if they're a student and they just have access to an open mat and you know, a couple of friends or even literally just one friend who trains that where you can get together and just learn to play these games. As you mentioned earlier, like the some of the different approaches that are game-based, whether it's eco or whatever, there is there can be an intimidation around it just based on, though at least the way it's been presented has been very much all or nothing. It's like, if it's this, it's just this, and you can't do any techniques, and you you just got to play these games this way. And yada, yada. Whereas we're trying to do with this is give you a few different categories of games that you can play. Some of them are very much based around you don't necessarily need to have a you know a technique taught to you. You're just developing skills through the game. Some of them are based around you know a technique and you want to or you know a position and you want to get better at it. Here are some guidelines to that and. Some of them are very much, you know, this is just a skill that you need to have. For example, we've got some games that are excellent for people who want to compete a lot because they focus on what are usually considered intangible skills that are just very hard to acquire in a gym that isn't primarily competition based. We've tried to take three primary categories, the first one being fuck your jujitsu and how do you do the different fuck your jujitsu rounds that we do at my academy and we break that down very specifically as to like what the different layers are, how you can give your partner, like how to create affordances so that, you know, one person does feel really comfortable allowing their partner to get certain amount of, or or far enough or deep enough for a certain amount of attack off before they respond. Because again, one of the primary things that people tend to do in jujitsu is try to not let things happen. And fuck your jujitsu is very much about like, I don't give a fuck about your jujitsu. So I'm going to let you do as much as you like before I actually try to respond. And so we we very much teach people what the different layers are for the, like, for somebody who just needs their hand held every step of the way, we're showing you how to do that. And then we've got more of the like mini games that we play that are based around, which would be probably the closest to the, like the, the eco type approach where it's just like, 
we're trying to force you to develop this skill. So we're going to set these constraints. We're going to set a, what are the, yeah. the goals or the tasks for one person? What are the goals of the tasks for the other person? What is the win condition? And then you can go at it with actually like a fair bit of intensity because the level of intensity that you bring to some of these games has to change dramatically based on the game and what you're trying to achieve. So the fuck your jujitsu can be done with a very low level of intensity all the way up to a fairly high level of intensity, depending on the skill level of both participants. With uh, more of the little mini games, then we've got a much higher level of intensity a lot of the time. And then finally, we've got our positional or situational sparring, which is uh, taking the approach of like, again, I think most gyms at this point do some positional sparring, but it tends to look like start in closed guard and then that's it. I just go from there or start in half guard and then just go from there. And if there's a parameter, it's start from half guard. And if one person gets a sweep, then it's done. If the other person gets a pass, then it's done. What we try to do in positional specific sparring is give more win conditions, more focused parameters, more focused tasks. Uh, as an example, if you're sparring the closed guard, there are different versions of that. It's not just start from the closed guard, go for a sweep or a submission. One of the parameters that we use, for instance, is if the guard player can get the passer's arm across the center line or get to an overhook and get their hips out to an angle. So basically, if I got to would be a strong attacking position from the guard, that's my win condition. We're done. For the top player, my win condition is I managed to get to my feet and take my hands off of you. At which point I would be just prying your guard open. We create like further limitations or very specific win conditions within each of the different positions that we are sparring. So we're, we're creating a, a lot of variety to the point where pretty much any skill that you want to develop in jujitsu should be achievable. Like you could create a very complete grappler by just doing the fuck your jujitsu stuff, the mini games, and the specific positional sparring, which are the three different sections in this instructional. And so that's kind of what we've done, uh, Stefan and I. May he rest in peace if anything happens to him tonight, fighting fires. You know what? If something happens to him, it's okay. We've immortalized him in art. He will be forever remembered as the <laughs> guy in in this depiction of you and him getting sent with a taint sweep. So that will be his uh, his legacy going forward. Sorry, Stefan. But, he, you know, all of the stuff. That That's what you get for missing an appointment for a podcast <laughs> to go save someone's life. You yeah, prick. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, all of what you're bringing up here, it's been a while since I've uh, touched on Josh Waitskin. So I can kind of tie that in here. Josh is the guy who wrote the awesome book, The Art of Learning. He's a Marcelo Garcia black belt. He's a chess, I believe, champion. He's even a competitive Tai Chi world champion, which apparently is a thing. Competitive Tai Chi sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it's sure. actually really interesting. So if I watched one of his matches and what it looks like, it actually looks kind of like a constraints led stand up game in a lot of ways. Like imagine that you're doing takedowns with someone. But your goal is to kind of work on your grip and your arm control. And so the rule is you can really only get someone to the ground through arm control. You can't like suplex them. You can't do a double leg or anything. You have to basically arm drag them or forearm control them so bad that they go to the ground. So it's basically like all hand fighting. Now, the end result is it winds up looking really fucking silly sometimes because it's just <laughs> two grown up guys trying to grab each other's arms and swing them around. But I mean, I got to assume that if you get enough people trying to do that at a high level, like any sport, you get enough people trying to do something at a high level and it's going to get hard no matter how dumb the thing looks on the surface. But one of the things he talks about is this mental model that he calls making smaller circles. And the idea is that when you're presented with a new skill, that you want to learn and you want to get really good at it, you want to shrink the learning domain down to the smallest area possible. Just the stuff that really, truly matters, master that, and then you can start adding all of the goofy variations on top of it. And this is kind of contrary to the way a lot of instructors teach, where they will go through the, you know, they'll show a technique and they'll ask everyone to complete all of the steps and they attack it like a rote memorization problem. But for reasons we've talked about ad nauseum, we know that's not optimal. And the beauty of a games-based approach is you can shrink the circle like that. So if, as you brought up, you know, you've identified one piece of the game that people really suck at and you want them to get better at, like guard retention, 
you can strip away most of the jujitsu, take all of that out and just create a very simple game that is focused on helping people retain guard. Maybe a game where, for example, they have to keep their legs in front of their opponent at all times. Yeah, well, I mean, that's literally what fuck you jujitsu passing and fuck you jujitsu guard retention is. It's just there's a constraint on the guard player that they're basically not allowed to play guard in any offensive capacity. You can't make grips, you can't make hooks, you can't make clamps, you can't slow the other person down. They are unconstrained. They can pass any way they like, and you just have to do guard retention. And, you know, I mean, again, just to, not that I want to hold myself up as any kind of example, but like I get tons of visitors at my gym. And when we play that game, even like good black belts, like guys who compete at black belt, they can't pass my guard when I'm just doing guard retention and they can pass any way they like. And it's just because I've played this fucking stupid game for almost 15 years now because. I was doing these games. I'm glad you actually brought up Josh Waitskin because Josh Waitskin is one of the reasons that Fuck You Jiu-Jitsu exists, is one of the reasons that I've been an advocate of gameplay for as long as I've had an academy, which is over a decade now, uh, because this is stuff I was doing as part of my development, you know, as a, you know, even before I got my black belt, before I, I had an academy here, I was doing no hands guard. I was doing stuff to try to isolate skills to develop them and the reading the art of learning was one of the resources that allowed me to come up with this sort of stuff. Cause again, like I always hesitate to say that I've really come up with anything other than the idea of using the word fuck to design a game. I very much have tried to design these games pretty specifically, but the idea of using games to create a skill certainly doesn't come from me. I know in jujitsu, there's a lot of, I suppose, you know, the, the Gracies have set the, uh, <laughs> You know, I've paved the way for pretending to have invented an approach to something and then trying to sell it to everybody. Uh, so we're certainly really guilty of that in the jiu-jitsu world. But like, I've long since tried to present this idea to people that I, what I'm doing is not unique. I'm just doing stuff that exists in other sports, exists in other endeavors, and just trying to translate it into a, a way that works for jiu-jitsu. And this idea of, you know, just drilling down to what is the essential skill that we're trying to develop and make a game out of it, which Waitskin describes so well, it was one of the inspirations behind all of, whether it's the fuck you jujitsu approach itself or, or any of the other gamified approaches that I use at my academy. Yeah. Yeah. And the beauty of shrinking these smaller games, having these very targeted games is it allows you, like Waitskin says, to focus on the piece that really matters. And a lot of the variability, which you honestly, in a role, you can't even control for anyway, you can layer that on once the foundation is solid. I mean, as an example, uh, one of my favorite passes is either the stack pass or the split stack, where you've got one of their legs kind of up on your shoulder instead of lifting them both up. And the way that I practiced that was rather than trying to get good at doing the stack or split stack pass, I practiced just keeping my elbows, knees tight and getting comfortable inside someone's guard, forcing their legs open and getting one up onto my shoulder. Because once I can get to that position where I've got one of their legs up and one down, I've got so many passing options, right? It doesn't matter at that point what the other person wants to do. And I've always found that to be a better way to get good fast. And that's kind of counterintuitive because people will often think, well, but Steve slash Rob, how can you get good at a technique if you don't train every one of the 10 steps in equal detail that my instructor told me to learn? And so it can be a bit counterintuitive that actually by ignoring a whole bunch of that and focusing on one piece of that and drilling that relentlessly that you can actually get better. And I think that is maybe something that I want to hear you explain. Why is that? Why is it that sometimes shrinking your focus results in better progress? than trying to learn everything all at once. Because human beings are fucking stupid, Steve. Fair. <laughs> are we still talking about NFTs? <laughs> yeah, 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 right. I mean, I, I say that, you know, bitterly and sarcastically, but I mean, honestly, like the thing about jujitsu is that it is really vast. I often give this example when new students come in, I'm, I'm taking them through their intro. I'm like, you know, you could learn every punch in boxing in like an hour or certainly in a week of training and it'll still take you years to be able to actually fluidly execute the different you know jab cross hook uppercut overhand like you know a couple of other variations but like there's a pretty limited amount of actual movements but once you start layering them together the the combinations there are still quite exponential right like now imagine jujitsu where there are thousands of potential techniques like there is just no way the average fucking moron is going to just 
memorize all that stuff. So like I, to me, it's like, I would say it's anybody that's experienced life on earth with other human beings should know that it's self-evident that somebody trying to just like memorize all this crap is never going to get all that good at it because while you're trying to memorize one thing over here, if you've got a limited uh, brain capacity, it's pushing other information out on the other side. So like you start memorizing this stuff, you stop getting good at this other stuff. So having this, like try to have this incredible random access memory, it's not the purview of most individuals, of most brains and how they work. Sure, there are people out there like Musumechi or Kyotera who legitimately do seem to just like be able to memorize thousands of techniques and be able to access them live, which is unbelievable. But the majority of people just can't do that. And so the way that you're going to learn better is to learn movement patterns and learn skill sets. So you don't have to be able to do a thousand moves that you're trying to memorize. What you have to be able to do is keep your base. Don't allow your elbows to get away from your body. Pin one of your partner's legs to the mat so that their hips are immobilized. Recover your posture when somebody grabs your head. Break people's posture so that when you go to do something to them, their spine isn't working quite right. Like there is, you know, keep, have good balance. When someone picks up one of your legs, there are skills, you know, have the ability to pick somebody up when they don't want you to have the ability to pin someone to the ground when they're trying to get up these kinds of things. So there are skills that you can just, you know, develop by playing these games that you wouldn't just absolutely not be able to develop by memorizing a bunch of techniques. Just think the vastness of jujitsu makes it pretty self-evident that you can't learn it by rote memorization. You have to just get in there, mix it up, have an idea of what your goals are. And that's why I think concept is so important because if you don't really understand conceptually what's going on, it doesn't matter how many games you play because if the tasks are so just specific to the game, then you don't really understand what you're trying to get at overall. But I mean, that's maybe a topic for another day. But as long as you have an understanding of what the like the basic physics and body mechanics of jujitsu are and why these goals exist creating gameplay around it is just so much more likely to enable people to develop the actual skill because skills are acquired for the most part easier and better through gameplay certain skills definitely like there are certain things that you just you have to have somebody teach you you have to have somebody explain to you the step by step method of doing it before you could ever actually like be able to have the skill when you're actually playing the game or when you're actually rolling because some things are just that unintuitive that complex that if someone didn't show them to you you wouldn't just arrive there on your own and you wouldn't just arrive there because of some clever constraints so there's like i'm certainly not trying to suggest that everything can and should be learned by just games and constraints but once you kind of have an idea of what the goals are definitely the best way to get good at it is by creating a game where there is live resistance and you have to do problem solving. Like we as human beings, like that's how we learn. We learn through problem solving, through solving puzzles, through, you know, having a certain optimal level of difficulty. Even if you want to go back to like the, the programming world or video games, there is a, an optimal, I think, I think some places call it the optimal state of arousal, which has sadly nothing to do with pornography, but it's just like, there's a sweet spot where something is, if it's too easy, you just get bored and you give up. If it's too hard, you get frustrated and you give up. But there's an optimal level of challenge with puzzles, with games, where it just keeps you engaged and you're trying to figure it out. And that's when our brains are the most active and the most rewarded. And that's what we're going for with this. It's just the, it's the most effective way for a human being to get good at a thing. Yeah, yeah, man, there's a ton to unpack there. I think you bring up wisely that, I mean, we've talked since day one about the importance of concepts in jujitsu and a challenge people often have is, okay, I understand what you're saying here, but how do I drill a concept? How do I practice a concept? I understand how to practice an arm bar, but how do I practice a concept like the elbow knee connection? And that's where get very targeted games come into play. That's one of the things I love about targeted games is you don't have to drill an entire technique. You can drill a concept. So if you want to focus on the concept and the notion that grips dictate position, and you should always focus on winning the grip fight, you can design games that are not really about classic jujitsu. You know, they don't really have much to do with passing or even positional advancement. You can design games just around 
learning to grip fight more effectively. So if you've ever listened to this show or BJJ Concepts and you want to know, okay, what's a good way to actually train this stuff? That's where very targeted games are amazing. Um, Something my brother once taught me a long time ago was that there are critical control points to different techniques in jiu-jitsu. Not every step of the ladder is just as important as others. Some things only happen once in a while. You know, so much of jiu-jitsu is dependent on your opponent and what their body type is and what they do. But there's other things that are always going to matter, other details that are almost always going to be something you want to make sure you get done. And understanding that, understanding that there is a core to each technique that you really need to nail, and usually that's going to line up with the concepts. If you can focus on training that, then a lot of the auxiliary details don't matter so much. I mean, if you can build a game, for example, where you get through or around a person's legs and you pin their shoulders... The actual details of a guard pass become much less relevant because you're going to figure it out on the fly. And not only that, when you talk about the targeting and the, let's say the critical control points, one of the things that I have found, I hesitate to use myself as an example, but I also think I'm a good example in the sense that, you know, A, I'm old and I'm not a good athlete <laughs> and I'm not particularly strong. And the amount of time that I have in training relative to and especially competing relative to a lot of the people that I train with and a, the, certainly the vast majority of people that I compete against is fairly minimal, right? Like I'm a guy who rolls three times a week, who came to uh, you know jujitsu more roundabout way, didn't have a lot of gi training when I got my black belt. They're, they're like, I've got a lot going against me. And when I train with, you know, again, black belts that are visiting my school, people whose schools I visit, yada, yada, yada. One of the things that I notice is, for example, if we're going to just have a role, there are black belts that visit my club and we'll have a role and it'll be a, you know, a fairly competitive role. And then we'll have another role and it'll be not competitive at all. And the person will ask me after is like, what's the difference? Why did, how come in that one role, like it was pretty close. And then in that other role, you just kick the shit out of me. I'm like, well, in the first role, I was just like allowing you to get to the positions. I wasn't like giving you a ton of resistance. I wasn't trying to focus on negating your game. In the next role, I played the engagement phase game with you. And they're like, well, what's that? Well, that is the game where before either of us have grips, there's an exchange that's going to be had. We're going to engage and either I'm going to win the grip fight and I'm going to get to a passing position if I'm the top player or I'm going to win the grip fight and I'm going to get to a guard if I'm the bottom player and the winner of that engagement phase dictates the next phase. And so we weren't playing the engagement phase game for the entire round, but what we were doing was having a round of jujitsu where because I decided I was definitely going to try to win the engagement phase every time, I never got to find out how good your jujitsu was because I never let you get a guard established or get a passing position established. I just won the engagement phase got to my position and just fucked you up from there. And like, if you're a good black belt and I let you put me in X guard, I can't just fuck you up. I'm not that good. I'm 47. I'm, uh, you know, a pretty decent black belt, but I'm not fucking, you know, adult black belt world champion. I'm not super good, you know, elite level, you know, world-class kind of grappler. I'm just pretty good, but I'm good enough that if I can bypass your strengths, even if you're a black belt, I will absolutely fuck you up. And the only reason I have the ability to do that is because I've played a lot of these games, right? Like we have visiting black belts that come to my club and we'll do some of the fuck your jiu-jitsu games. They absolutely have no chance, even though they're good. Like, you know, we'll have a, a regular role and it'll be somewhat competitive, but we'll play one of those games. And you can see there are skills that they, even though they're, they're good black belts and they've got a good overall skill set, there are certain things that they just absolutely can't do. Like there are just skills that they do not have because all they've ever done is roll. And so the amount of reps that they have on completing a sweep against somebody who has good base and is actively trying to resist that sweep are minimal. Whereas I've got tons of rounds of people trying to absolutely not let me sweep them at the last stage. One of those being Rory, a fucking six foot six scarecrow who used to skateboard, so has unreal like base and proprioception and ability to recover from really deep sweep positions. If I can put Rory's ass down, I can put just about anybody down that I'm going to play that game with. 
Whereas when they try to sweep me, I can give them 90% of what they need and they still will never, ever, ever complete a sweep on me. We can play fuck you jiu-jitsu top control where because they've only ever tried to pin people with a cross face and underhook and heavy chest to chest pressure. When you take those tools away from them and it's like, you got to hold me down just using levers or frames and wedges, but you can't put your chest on my chest. They can't hold me there for 10 seconds. Whereas I can hold them almost indefinitely. And again, if you don't have these games, there's absolutely no way you could develop these skills. So I think I'm a really good example of how you can achieve good competitive success and just good overall success in jujitsu by focusing on these really specific things. Even if you don't have A, a lot of athleticism, B, the recovery time that comes with being young or taking steroids and being able to train six days a week and two times a day and all that. I have a limited amount of time training and I have a limited amount of like physical resources and yet I'm still able to be much more effective than I frankly should be. And I ascribe that half to the conceptual approach or maybe 30% to the conceptual approach and probably as much as, you know, 50, 60, 70% to the fact that I play a lot of these games. So I have a much more diverse skill set where I can be skillful in so many more areas than somebody who just only ever rolls, even if they are very, very good from just rolling. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a whole element of strategy involving shutting your opponent down. I mean, I've heard this described as anti-jujitsu or Josh Wentworth from Georgia calls it negative jujitsu. The idea being a lot of the time we call it shobbing at my academy. <laughs> well, the idea being a lot of the time it's easier to stop your opponent from doing what they want to do than it is to do what you want to do. And I mean, look, there's very successful grapplers and cage fighters who have built a whole style around negative grappling and negative fighting, where a big part of what they do is just try to shut the other person down. Yeah, shut your game down, bro. I got to shut your game down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're going into a competitive environment, it's not a bad strategy at all. But when you're in the lab or, you know, you're trying to learn. And just sorry to cut you off, but to be fair, we also do games like that, where because you know, one of the things that people who don't compete very much fall prey to is, they want to play too much. I know Joseph Chen talked about this very recently. I saw him speaking about how like, because he's so like, I'm glad he, he gave us a bit of a shout out where we, because he came up originally at a school, Guillaume's Academy, Nanjing BJJ, where he was introduced to fuck your jujitsu. And it was apparently quite formative in his approach to learning. You know, he was willing to engage and play and, and kind of would, because he had developed such a diverse skill set that he could allow his opponents to get to certain spots on him and he would always just have the answer but then he found that that was running out at the you know at the peak you know when you get a real specialist you, know, you get a guy who's crazy good at the legs like a Mateusz Szczecinski you don't want to let that guy get on your legs because no matter how good you might be at dealing with it he's probably going to get you anyway and so he very much had to change his approach up and be better at like shutting the guy's game down and not letting him get there so for the people that have a very playful approach and want to use games to learn how to be more competitive or more of a competitor or more of a competition-based grappler, we will give you games that can develop that aspect of your grappling as well, because like everything is a skill. Every aspect of grappling can be drilled down into a skill and the, you know, the shob skill of just like keeping people off you, like we're in the midst of our Nogi Worlds camp and one of the games that I've been having my students play is just like, this is how you just absolutely keep someone from ever getting to a scoring position on you. And if it comes down to it in a match and you're up and you need to eat out, like eat up the clock, if you don't have the skill to beat them by passing their guard at that point and you're up, at least keep them from getting to a position where they can sweep or threaten a sweep or a submission on you. That has validity. It's not my favorite. It's one of the last things I ever want to do. But you can turn any goal into a game that allows you to meet that goal. That's one of the best things about gamification is the sheer versatility. You know, if you look at a lot of other coaching systems, when you start asking questions about, okay, how do I apply this in this context or this other context, it doesn't really fit well. Whereas you can gamify basically anything. Like in this case, if someone is so into gamification that it results in them being too playful, you can gamify competitive behavior as well, right? To steer them back in that other direction. And I can relate to that. I mean, I've always had a very playful, almost troll-based jujitsu style where I just do weird dumb shit to see if it can work. 
And the problem is it gets so fun that sometimes my actual core jujitsu atrophies because I just don't do it enough. And the beauty of games is if you can identify those things, then you can direct your training in any way. You can focus on developing new skills. You can focus on shutting your opponent down. You can focus on whatever you want. However, the one thing that gamification does need is that conscious understanding of okay, what's the thing I really need to actually work on here? And this might be where some people kind of find it hard to apply this because you have to actually think about it, right? If I want to drill an arm bar and learn to get good at an arm bar, I can watch a bunch of very detailed step-by-step instructionals and just copy them. But if I want to build a game that's actually going to improve something about me, that requires me to have really clear awareness of what my weaknesses are and how I need to fix those. And then I can design my game around that. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, for really, for anyone, both coaches or just students, how do you identify what kind of game would be best for you and build games that are going to be most productive? This is where, again, like so much of the gamification stuff for me has been so like, like that's never been an issue from like the core problem. And by the way, before I forget to drop the Simpsons reference, when you said like the solution to too much gamification is just a different game. It's like the, you know, the prohibition episode is like to alcohol, the cause of and solution to all our problems, like games, the cause of and solution to all our problems in jujitsu. For me earlier on, the idea of identifying weaknesses and trying to remedy them was never an issue. Because I very much view this as a, a process of discovery. Like when I say view this, I mean learning jujitsu, trying to be good at jujitsu. I view this as a process of discovery. I want to be good at it. I want to solve all the puzzles. I The puzzle is the thing for me. This is not an endeavor where I'm trying to just win competitions or just be able to beat people. I have always been about the game of jujitsu. Whereas I've found that a lot of people, as you mentioned, people who are coming to this more for ego gratification reasons or not even ego gratification, but like you said, self-defense or like, you know, MMA, like I find MMA fighters to be some of the absolute worst people to train, sorry, depending on the level of MMA fighter, because if you're kind of a low level MMA fighter, you really, for the most part, don't like jujitsu and don't want to learn jujitsu, right? Like most low level MMA fighters tend to be guys who want to stand and bang and want to learn just enough takedown defense to be able to stand and bang and just enough jujitsu to get out of submission so they can get back to standing and banging. Holy fuck are those people ever a nightmare to try to train because all they ever want to do is just shut your game down, bro. And so they don't ever want to go very deep into any of the actual skills. They just want to get away with learning the absolute minimum that they possibly can and they spar insanely fucking hard so they're not actually developing. And again, this isn't, you know, hashtag not all MMA fighters, but certainly the ones that never really make it to a particularly high level are the ones that are just not willing to work on a a weakness because they don't like it. And this is so true of so many people who are trying to learn jujitsu, whether it's, you know, the people who get caught up in the bullshit self-defense jujitsu where like they're, I just want to know how to defend myself. I don't need to learn X guard. Anything where you're limiting, like you're creating an identity around, oh, pff, I don't need to learn that is obviously limiting. It's a self-limiting belief. And so I think that a lot of people who come to jujitsu come to it with some variety of self-limiting belief, whether it's I'm a striker, therefore I don't need that much of this, or I'm a self-defense guy, therefore I don't need this, or I'm a I'm a top player, therefore I don't need the guard. I, you know, I'm a guard player. I don't need to learn take. Like, there's so many things that you can build an identity around in a negative way. And we kind of we talked about this a little bit in the um, the mindset episode that we did, where like what you design your identity around is going to be more responsible than any other thing for the results that you get in life. And so, uh, what I have tried to do especially with the fuck your jiu-jitsu stuff is create an exploratory identity for people through the games and that's what i think the real value of it is it's like the hardest thing to get people to do is just to let go of that like ah, I, I don't want to like like i don't want to play i we got it with, you've heard me use the term people who take their ball and go home there's so much of that in jiu-jitsu where people consider it a win to just 
shell the fuck up and not let anything happen. And that is so incredibly limiting. The people that come from schools that like just absolutely suck almost always still have that ability. They can just take their ball and go home because that's all they've really done. And they somehow convince themselves that holding the fetal position, which they were born with the ability to do, is somehow a skill in jujitsu. And so getting people out of that mindset is the most valuable thing about like, how do I design a game? You can talk about the constraints, you can talk about the goals, the tasks, the the skills, like whatever, those are all extremely valuable. But you really do have to focus on while you're describing the game or while you are setting the culture of the gameplay at your academy, really discouraging that like, you know, self-limiting belief, I, you know, identity sort of thing and really encouraging the like the only way you can really win here is by playing the game by engaging in it and trying to discover the various parameters trying to discover the different skills uh, through the game and not make it about oh i i don't need to learn that because i'm just this over here Th- does that make sense 100% 100% and this as you i mean this is a natural part of getting older and more experienced you kind of get entrenched in doing what you've always done because it works which is understandable because you got good at something by doing it. And the problem is, though, as you get better at one thing, it can make it harder for you to dial back and become a beginner again at something new. It is hard to do when you've got these tools in your toolkit that work very well. What's my motivation to go and try some new skill I'm not good at? But the problem is, like you said, this and just the labels that you apply to yourself can be extremely self-limiting because like you brought up in that example with Joseph Chen, I mean, eventually you're going to find that person where your A game just doesn't work. And you better have a plan B at that point. And, you know, and there's also just something to be said about being a well-diversified human being. I mean, in the prior episode to this one, I interviewed Victor Hugo. And out of all of the things that this guy wanted to talk about, he wanted to talk about the intersection of business jujitsu and how to balance them. And he talked about how being a diverse human has added so much value to his life and made him both a better competitor and business person. I can actually vouch for that as well, because I have been for the majority of my life, a very person that lacked diversity. I was very, you know, autistically mono focused on how can I learn this one skill as much as possible. And I've found that as I've become more diverse as an individual, which I've had to make a conscious effort to do, because it's not something that appeals to me. I very the appeal for me is in like super deep dive into one thing. And as I've become more diverse as a person and more diverse as a business owner, like like you know, I recently acquired the unit next door to my academy, so I'm temporarily a landlord, which I never thought I would become. And like the skill of communicating with the people that are now my tenants and all that, like this is a different skill that I have to work on. One of the reasons I have the visiting student program is so that I can become more effective at communicating with people socially outside of the realm of jiu-jitsu. And as I've managed to invest more in those kind of diverse skills as a human being, I found that this year, more so than any other, my club has grown dramatically. The business has succeeded that much more than it ever has before, not because I've become better as an instructor, because I think at this point I'm into the diminishing returns on any improvement that I make as an instructor already far and away better than anyone else in the area that somebody might come to for jujitsu training. So me being any better as a coach or instructor isn't going to make any difference in terms of uh, gaining new students, but just being able to create a different atmosphere at my club and relate to people on a human level better as an individual, I think is what's responsible for increased success in business. So I think that's a wonderful point that you brought up or that that Victor brought up is that a little bit more diversity allows for so much better problem solving across the board. Yeah, there's actually an area of science that explores this. I mean, I am not super well versed in this, so please don't take this as gospel, but sometimes it's called transfer of learning. And the idea being that you can learn tangential, possibly even unrelated skills And it can give you a different perspective that allows your different areas of knowledge to cross pollinate and inform each other. Um, Interestingly, they've even experimented with doing this with AI. Uh, It's an area called transfer learning and even machines can learn that way too, to some extent. I mean, again, please don't take this as some sort of definitive statement, not an expert here, but 
I do find it interesting that there's a lot of people looking into just how sometimes looking into unrelated skills or tangential skills can make you better at the thing you were actually trying to get better at in the first place. And that's one of the areas where games is are really great because they encourage you to branch out and try new things in a, in a non-intimidating way. If I go into a role, and I've had coaches do this where they say, and this is their idea of creating constraints. They'll say something like, okay, we're going to spar, but we want to work on triangles today. So the only submission you're allowed to do is a triangle. All that's going to result in people really doing is just shutting down each other's triangles because they know exactly exactly what's coming and no one's going to feel good coming out of that. It's just going to lead to deadlock jujitsu. But if you create a game that's smaller and narrower, and it's very clearly advertised as a game, you change the culture, you change the tone around it. And you also make things a lot more measurable because it's very hard to just show up one day and be bad at triangles and then leave. And now suddenly you're awesome at triangles. It's hard to measure progress like that. But for a specific game, like if, for example, you're on top of me and my goal is to maintain an elbow knee connection the whole time to never let you get that inside rib hip space on me. That's a very easy game to measure. I can do that. No problem. I don't need to be a technical expert to practice that. And when I go home, I have a pretty good idea of how I performed and that helps me do better next time and make adjustments. So I think there's just so much freedom and power in thinking of things as, as games. And again, not even just in jujitsu, but just life in general. And just to touch on the, the, the triangle thing. So one of the, in one of the sections of the instructional, we talk about how we spar certain positions. So like when we spar the triangle, one of the games is you start in a threatened triangle, but you're not allowed to finish the triangle. So all you ever, like you spend the entire round and we do the similar thing with the armbar. You start in the armbar position, but you're not allowed to actually get the tap from the armbar. You can tap them with other submissions. You can transition to the back. You can transition to the mount. You know, but basically you spend the entire round trying to hold the armbar position for as long as possible. So if you spend an entire round trying to just keep somebody inside of a triangle and you, you do have the option of submitting them with other things, you actually get really good at triangles because you get really good at holding people in that position. And then you can make a game around, you know, can I just break your posture? Then you make a game where you start with the triangle and you can finish with the triangle, but it cannot be the triangle that you started with. So for example, we will start with a, you know, like a front facing triangle from the guard type of thing. And you can finish with any other triangle. So you can rotate around the axis of your partner's neck and finish with different side or back triangles but you can't finish with a front facing triangle, which again, makes you a lot better at triangles because if you ever get your initial triangle shut down, you know immediately that you can just rotate around that axis. So there are still, even within the context of like, hey, let's just spar the triangle. There are ways that you can design games that will still yield a really fantastic learning curve within that position. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the other beauty, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, the other beauty about games is They can be very helpful in asymmetric training environments. So a lot of the time people are very worried about the quality of their training partners and hey, you know, if I'm a black belt, what am I going to get out of training with a bunch of white belts and blue belts? I mean, the answer is if you've got good games in place, you can get a lot out of training with them. I mean, I am usually the most experienced person on the mat at my gym and I just design very restrictive games that make it a fair fight so that people have a chance. Sometimes that means I have to do stuff like let some white belt put me in a fully locked in submission, right? But I still get good reps. I lose sometimes because that's the goal. Like the other day I got tapped up by a white belt because this happens. And that means I'm getting value out of the role. If you're just steamrolling the same people over and over again, you're probably not putting enough effort into making games that make it a challenge for you. And so whenever you're in that kind of situation, this is where games become very powerful. And the other thing that's great about them too is games, you can <laughs> you can play with yourself, right? I mean, you unlike a lot of other coaching systems, I don't need to get my coach on board. I don't need to get my training partner on board. I can just play fuck your jujitsu, right? If I am sparring with a white belt, I can just let him get a fully locked in submission on me and then start working from there. I can disrespect his jujitsu in that way. I don't need anyone's permission to train that way. I mean, this is most of my roles with anybody below purple belt. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Whether it's at my academy or anybody else's academy, I am doing fuck your jujitsu of some sort. Yeah. Uh, I am working on specific skills of some sort. And it, by the way, it's, it's funny that you mentioned the playing with yourselves because I, if he changes the title on me, I'm going to be pissed. 
because one of the things that I try to insist on is the title of this instructional should be quit playing with yourself. <laughs> yeah. How to use games like fuck your jujitsu, et cetera, et cetera, to you know, get better at jujitsu or get, you know, play with others, whatever. I definitely want the playing with yourself as, as part of this thing. Well, it's a valid point though, that there is a lot of utility in being able to direct your training on your own. The big problem that people bring to my attention all the time is they'll say, Steve, these ideas that you talk about on podcasts, these modern coaching methods, they sound fantastic. Wish I could try them. But my instructor is this hardcore dude who's been doing the same thing for 30 years. And, you know, he's all about drill to kill and all of this stuff. And he just he's not hearing any of it. And so what can I do? And there's no other gym in the area. So it's either this or I don't train at all. And I mean, look, you're probably not going to be able to convince that person to implement a full reverse classroom model. But what you can do is you can go into that gym and you can create games for yourself, like fuck your jujitsu. And that's super valuable. Also, it's a great conversation starter because like you said, after like the third time you've done this to someone, eventually they're going to ask, what the hell are you doing and why is it working so well? And then you can sell them fuck your jujitsu, which I'm presuming is what you want to do now, right? Let's talk about where people can learn all of this stuff. Yeah. Yes. I wish we did have Stefan here so he could confirm for us what the exact title of this is going to be but like i said i fuck your jujitsu is definitely going to be in the title whether it's the actual title or the subtitle and i'm hoping that quit playing with yourself <laughs> or some variation of that is going to be the main title but either way it will be you know the the game of the the fuck your jujitsu gamification or gamification and fuck your jujitsu positional sparring whatever instructional from uh, grapplearts.com and it's hopefully fingers crossed here going to be released um, like mid-december to late december nice so this episode might come out around that time maybe even a little bit before so what i will do is i'll put those links in the show notes i'll put a link to grapple art so everyone can go there i am sure that when this is released it'll be easy to find on the website so stefan kesting's website grapplearts.com is where this is going to live again link in the show notes but if people want something right now, Rob, we got to talk about BJJ concepts. Give it the plug. Come on, tell me about it. We've got an entire section on the site uh, for how to do fuck your jiu-jitsu. We've got mini games. Like a lot of my gamification stuff is also available. It's just this instructional is like, you know, if you need a resource for like, how do I play games of any sort, some examples of some games, how can I design them, etc. This is going to be your jam. But yeah, so bjjconcepts.com or .net, both will take you to my website if you want to sign up for that. We've got some great gamification stuff on there. Plus, obviously, all of our core concepts, our 101 and 201 curriculum. There are, gosh, probably around 3,000 lessons on the site at this point. It's got to be one of the bigger resources out there. And it's certainly the only resource that I know of that has a pedagogy section that teaches you how to teach, how to be a good instructor, whether it's for group classes, private classes, seminars, how to coach at tournaments, how to uh, run your business, all that kind of stuff. We've got a pretty good resource on there. So if you're less interested in the games and more interested in the concepts and an actual curriculum, we've got that as well. Awesome. And if people want to shoot you messages and ask you questions or buy your NFT, where can they reach out to you? I am on Instagram for the time being until I can find somebody to, until there's an AI that can reliably replicate my inimitable style. I am actually the person that you are talking to. If you message me on Instagram at Island Top Team, you can certainly get in touch with my academy info at islandtopteam.com. If you wanted to schedule a visit or, you know, have me out for a seminar or anything like that. Yeah. You can hit me up through either of those sources. Amazing. Well, thanks, man. As always, I'll put those links in the show notes. All of our stuff, if people want it, is at bjjmentalmodels.com. Tons and tons of episodes, many of them with our friend Rob here going in, into the back catalog there. There's a lot of content that's intended to be just as useful today as when it was recorded. So do check all of that out. That's also where you can sign up for our awesome newsletter. We send out some great thought pieces as well as show notes every week. Um, beyond that, if you want more, BJJ Mental Models Premium is where you go to do that. Again, this is all at bjjmentalmodels.com. If you're unsure of what premium is, we've got a massive catalog of um, audio courses on strategy, tactics, 
best concepts with uh, some of the, the best minds in the sport, including our friend Rob here. Uh, beyond that, you can also... I was going to say some of the best minds in the sport and, and Rob. Rob yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and beyond that, of course, that's where you can also get direct coaching from our review team. We've got some amazing coaches on there. Uh, recently, we added uh, Josh McKinney of Designated Winner Fame. Existing coaches include um, Emily Kwok, Dominica Oblanite, Brianna St. Marie, Marco Ciccarelli. So really awesome roster there. If you want to get direct one-on-one coaching from them, I just, I defy you to find a better price for that than what we offer on BJJ Mental Models Premium. So again, everything's at BJJMentalModels.com. I'll put a link to that and to all of Rob's stuff in the show notes. But Rob, thanks a lot, man. Great chat. Glad we were able to make this happen. Hope uh, Stefan saved the cats and uh, put out the fire and did all of that other good stuff as well. Perfect. Now you and I can go back to playing with ourselves. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, Rob. I appreciate it greatly. No worries. Take care, Steve. You too. Thanks to the listeners as well. Talk to you next time. Take care.